Hey, uh, you know that uh, before COVID hit, we always passed an offering basket at this point in the service. We haven't done that since COVID. Don't know if we'll do that in the future. So if you have an offer, um, an off, a financial offering, we invite you to put it in those baskets on your way out as you leave the sanctuary. And yet that we make an offering in the midst of our service is really important because that's really the point of the service. And so this morning, I would like you to make an offering that really is yourself. So uh, hopefully all of you have a piece of paper and a pencil. If you don't, uh, Brett and John will be handing those out. Can you raise your hand if you don't have a piece of paper and a pencil? Okay, so you can hand those out because this is what I want you to do. Um, On one side of the piece of paper, Uh, on the front of your piece of paper, I want you to uh, offer your best to the Lord. So what is it that you um, like about yourself? So let's say that you were applying for the position of ambassador of the kingdom of God. What would you put on your resume? Um, maybe something like, well, I've been a Bible study, home Bible study leader for uh, 10 years, or consistent church attendance and giving, maybe kind personality, forgiving attitude, tendency to withhold judgment. But I want you to take just about a minute and write those things down on that side of the piece of paper, what you like about yourself, and that you now give to the Lord as your offering. Okay, does that make sense? And then after you've done that, I want you to flip it over and I want you to write whatever you would not want to put on your resume. (laughs) That is what you don't like about yourself. Perhaps something like, I had an affair, I got an abortion in college, I can't forgive my dad for what my dad did to me. I want you to take about two minutes and don't sign your name, okay? Just, Just write those two things. And then feel free to fold the paper in half so the good is on the outside and the evil is on the inside, or the bad is on the inside, I should say, because that's what we do all the time anyway, right? And while Anthony plays, uh, just kind of has some background music for two minutes, you're going to fill out your piece of paper. And then when we start singing, um, John and Brett will come through with the baskets, and I want you to make uh, your offering, okay? So Lord God, we offer ourselves to you. Amen. I want to pray at the start of the message just because uh, this is such a weird weekend with uh, what's happening in the Ukraine. So Lord God, I, I want to pray that you would take Vladimir Putin out of power. And Father, I feel like I need to keep going on in my prayer and ask that you would take the evil out of Vladimir Putin's heart and replace it with the good. And Lord God, I know I need to keep praying because that evil spreads. And so now, Jesus, I... Pray you take the evil out of teenage Russian boys who were handed a rifle and told to shoot people. I pray you take the evil out of Ukrainians who are so angry as they watch their loved ones die and everything they've worked for crumble before them. I pray you take the evil out of the hearts of Ukrainians and out of the hearts of Russians. I pray you take the evil out of Europe and take the evil out of America and take the evil out of our hearts, Lord God, uh, the hearts of uh, us Americans who think we would never do something like that. Oh God, I pray that you take us all back to the garden and you judge the hell out of us, judge the heaven into us and make us ambassadors, Lord God not of the kingdom of the United States of America, but of the kingdom of God. Lord God, I I pray that that you would take us all back to the tree. I thank you that you are, and I pray that you would do it as soon as possible. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, you may be seated.
Thank you. If you've been around this sanctuary uh, for a while, uh, you know that I seem to always find a way to show you this picture, right? <laughs> and it's really not because I'm into this particular artist, but just because I think he saw something that artists and poets sometimes see, but Bible scholars and theologians don't seem to, to see. I think he sees that there's just one tree in the garden, and on the tree is the judgment of God. I think he sees what St. Paul sees, and we often really do not want to see, and that is that when we took the knowledge of the good, we also took the life of God. In Romans, Paul's been talking about Adam and judgment and law and grace, and he's argued that the judgment does not change, but we change. In Genesis, you know, God puts Adam, which means humanity, in a garden, and in the middle of the garden, in one spot, he puts two trees, or one tree that does two things. It brings death, and it gives life. In the Gospel of John, you remember Jesus is crucified on a tree that we often call the cross, in a garden, according to John, in the very same spot, according to Orthodox Jews, it's the Temple Mount, where Jesus hung like fruit on a tree and was offered up for the sins of the world. Taking his life on that tree is the epitome of evil. That he gave his life on that tree is the revelation and the definition of the good. In the Revelation, we don't read anything about the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And yet everyone in the New Jerusalem has knowledge of evil because they constantly praise God for the good and that uh, God has overcome the evil with the good who happens to be a slaughtered lamb. And in the middle of the city is the tree of life whose leaves are for the healing of the nations. That's humanity. Remember God had placed a flaming sword at the entrance to the garden, right? so that humanity would not eat of the tree and live forever. At least not as we were, because that would be an endless living death. And yet in the garden city of the New Jerusalem, all the nations do eat of the tree and never die. And so dying, they had to have died, but now they live and never die. I mean, maybe the judgment of God is that each of us would die with Christ and rise with Christ, and maybe the judgment of God has never, ever, ever changed. So if you would, uh, just hold up your thumb, okay, about, about, a, about, a, about you know, a foot or two from, from your face and look at the tree. Look at the, the cross in the middle of our stage, okay? But now, um, I want you to remember something. I want you to remember that your, that your thumb is, who, is, is part of you, all right? So I want you to say this. My thumb is me. Okay, correct. Now focus on your thumb. And as you focus on your thumb, count the trees. Okay, now there are, there's two trees, right? There's one me and two trees. But now focus on the tree. And there's what? There's one tree and two me's. You understand? If you see yourself as one, you'll see the judgment of God as two. And then, and then you'll think to yourself, God might decide to kill me and torture me without end. In other words, I might get the tree of death. Or God might decide to bless me endlessly with life. Maybe I'll get the tree of life. Perhaps he'd, he'd do this uh, to demonstrate his power. You know, maybe death, maybe life. Or maybe he'd do this because, I don't know, maybe I smoke one cigarette too many. Or I harbor just a little bit too much of resentment in my heart. On the other hand, if you see one tree and 
two me's, if you see that the judgment of God is, is one, and remember Paul just told us, let God be true though every man be a liar. That's to be two. If you see that the judgment of God is one, you also see that every man, every Adam is two. In the words of Paul, there's an old Adam and there's a new Adam. In other words, I have an old me and a new me. I got two me's, according to Paul. Well, because we tend to think that everything begins with me, because we tend to think that man, Adam, is the measure of all things, because we tend to think that each one of us is one, we tend to think that God is two and that he changes. So if we just, you know, if we just tried harder, maybe we could change the judgment of God. I think that's why we find the Bible so bewildering. And then we assume that after all the talk of time and eternity, sovereignty and predestination, vessels of wrath and vessels of mercy, that what the Bible really is saying, what it's really saying is just try harder. Get more, what you need is more knowledge of good and evil and then try harder. Try harder and you can change the judgment of God. But you see, if, I, if we really paid attention, I think we'd see that Scripture is saying um, you cannot change the judgment of God. But the judgment of God will change you. The judgment of God is to destroy the old you and reveal or create the, the new you, a you that knows the evil but constantly chooses the good, a you that lives and never dies, the very image and likeness of the invisible God. So in the last few weeks, we've been chewing on Paul's incredible statement in Romans 5.14 that Adam is a type, a tupos, an imprint of, quote, the one being about to be, whom we know to be the eschatos Adam, the perfect image of the invisible God, Jesus. Remember we said that this uh, Superman was... Uh, like the eschatos man, the ultimate Adam, the very image of the invisible God, the perfect image of the invisible God, Jesus, and this, uh, this block of clay, if, if, uh, this, this imprint left by the Adam in the clay um, is, is, is a tupos, according to Greek, and that the tupos is, is me. Adam, the presence of the absence, or the experience of the presence of the absence of, of, the, of the Superman. The one, let's see if I can get him on a stand here, the one being about to be. At the end of last week's message, just before I told you about Jesus walking me and my golem into the burning lake of love, I, I, I put this picture on, on the screen. It's a picture that I've used in several different sermons uh, from several different books that we've preached to over the years. I like using these pictures over and over again because I'm lazy. I don't want to redraw them. And uh, because I want you to see that all of Scripture, I think, is testifying to the same thing. So this has shown up in Genesis, Ephesians, Ecclesiastes. For now, I just want you to think about the me on the left and the me on the right. The me on the left, you see, is like the, the tupos, the, the type, the type of the one being about to me. He's the me that I think I create. I may not be much, but all I think about is me, that, that me. <laughs> The me I create. He's constructed with my, judge, my judgments in, in the absence of God's judgment. You remember that the snake tempted Adam, Adam in the form of Eve, because Eve is Adam and Adam is Eve. He tempted her to take the fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in order to make herself in the image of God. He tempted her to take the law, knowledge of good and evil, that we take, judge herself, and justify herself. Last week we saw that this is the sin. Paul points out the sin. The archetypical sin and the root of sin, it's the root of all disobedience. Well, when Adam took the knowledge of the good, 
he also took the life of the one who is good, just as we all did on the tree in the garden on Mount Calvary. And so Adam knew at that point what he should be, which is what he couldn't be, for when he took the good, he took the life, which meant he was dead and dying and evil. It's what each one of us do every time we sin. We build a body of sin. Sin and death, a false self constructed on a lie. In John 8, Jesus says to, quote, the Jews that had believed in him, Jesus said, you are of your father, the devil. He is the father of lies. The devil cannot create true people, but with lies, he gets us to construct false people, hypocritas, hypocrites, and actors. In that way, I become imprisoned in a self that I pretend is me and convince and, and convince myself it is me, but in reality is, is hell because I'm alone. Or at least I think I'm alone. If I, that Spirit of God, breathed into me in the beginning. So see the guy on the left? Can you see the little red eye right there between the darkness and the, eye, the lies? If I don't die to myself, my old psyche, before my physical body dies, I can get stuck in my psychic body without my physical body, a ghost. Trapped in outer darkness where men weep and gnash their teeth. The Bible calls that Hades or Sheol. So every time we sin, we trap ourselves in death and enslave ourselves to evil, even if we say that we believe in Jesus and cry out, Lord, Lord, like the sons of the kingdom that Jesus described in Matthew chapters 7 and 8. So believing the lie and so taking the law to justify myself, I become imprisoned within myself, which is what I think I should be, but am not. It's the presence of the experience of an absence. Just as darkness is the presence of the experience of the absence of, of light. Just as lies is the presence of the experience of the absence of truth. Just as death is the, the presence of the experience of the absence of the life. The old man is comprised of those things that we wrote on the back of our sheet at the offering. It's the reality that we all are tempted to hide. And yet even more, the old man, maybe those things were all tempted to advertise. The things that we wrote on the front of our offering sheets, our resume. If I'm proud of me and I boast in, in me, it reveals that I think I created me which also reveals that I think I am uncreated or uh, I um, am not created. Wherever I have faith in Mises, I'm trying to say, it reveals that I have no faith of Jesus. If I think I should love because I have knowledge of love, it reveals that I don't love and don't want to love except to get some reward for love which is not love and God is love. The law reveals that I don't love God. In chapter three, Paul told us, none is righteous, no, not one. So self-righteousness must be the greatest form of unrighteousness. And that could very well be the thing that you wrote on the front of your sheet. Your offering sheet. But here's, here's a wild thought. If you offered those things that you wanted to hide, they're no longer hidden. They're exposed to the light. And Paul says in Ephesians, whatever is exposed to the light becomes visible and is itself light. And maybe that would even include self-righteousness, which is the greatest unrighteousness. It's the greatest darkness. Well, perhaps that darkness could become the greatest light. <laughs> Just like old Rabbi Saul became the Apostle Paul. Well, the man on the left is me, the me that I think 
I create. And, and ironically, he's ultimately empty, right? <laughs> he's nothing. For apart from Jesus, I can do nothing. That's what I do, nothing. But the man on the right is not what I have done, but what God has done, will do, and does do. With the faithfulness of, of Jesus, he's the Superman, the eschatos man, God's word in flesh, Jesus, and amazingly, he somehow becomes me, the, the, the true me. In the words of Paul, the true me is God's workmanship, created, that's already created, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Uh, the new me is not what I should do. The new me is who I am. The me that God creates doesn't love because he should love. He loves because he's been loved. And now he's filled with love. Love is the judgment of God in me. And love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things, writes Paul. Love does everything. So when I love, love is being me. <laughs> And then I am free. Why? Because I, I, I do what I want, and I want what I do. And in Jesus, I do all things. Apart from Jesus, I can do nothing. And yet Paul says, in Jesus, I can do all things. Last week at the end of the message, Janelle, back there, Janelle, uh, my friend Janelle came forward she took the tupas, the empty clay vessel, in one hand, and she took my Superman figurine in the other hand. And she said, Peter, we sat right there. She said, I think what you get, I think I get what you mean by this old Adam, and I think I get what you mean by this new Adam, but what was that thing, <laughs> that hot mess in the middle? What was, what, was, what was that? And I, I said um, something like, well, yeah, sorry to just throw that at you like that, but that's you. <laughs> the hot mess is you. Uh, the you that's uh, being created, me being created in space and time. The old man is temporal and fading away. The, the new man is eternal and cannot be destroyed, and, and you are both. <laughs> I am, I am both. You're the hot mess. You're like a, a field of wheat and tares. You know that story Jesus tells. Wheat and tares look just alike, although they're entirely different species. They're incredibly hard for us to tell apart. You can't judge, for if you try to judge between the wheat and the tares, you'll, you'll unroot, un, unroot them all, rip them all out of the field. Then then she said something like this. Okay, Janelle said, but how do I get from one to the other? Something like that, right, Janelle? I think. This is how I remember it. You can, you can revise this later. She, but she's like, how do I get from one? How do I get from Mises to Jesus? How do I get from the Adam that thinks he can justify himself to the Adam that knows he has been justified, eternally justified? And I said something like, well, that's the rub. You can't. And I can't. And if I could, I wouldn't have faith in Jesus, God is salvation. I'd have faith in Mises, that I am salvation, which wouldn't be salvation, but would be a swirling pit of deeper and deeper damnation. So Paul isn't saying, try harder. He's saying, you're dead. Salvation isn't something I can do, and yet it is something that is done. So what can I do? Well, by the mercies of God, by the grace of God, I think I can observe the death and resurrection of me. Apparently, it makes me who it is that I eternally am. It finishes me in the image and likeness of God. So now let's read Romans chapter 6, even though we don't have time to explain all of Romans chapter 6. Probably there's not enough time in the universe. But anyway, and then I'll tell us what can be done 
that we cannot do. All right, Romans 6, verse 5, Paul writes, For if we've been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. Let me say it again so you hear it. If we've been united with him in a death like his, we'll certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old man was crucified with him in order that the body of the sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to the sin. For one who has died has been set free, literally justified, from the sin. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to, in, or by the sin once for all. 2 Corinthians 5.14, Paul writes this, the love of Christ controls us. Why? Because we have concluded this, that one has died for all. Therefore, all have died. It's as if Jesus absorbed all our bad will into his good will and bled all of his good will into our bad will. We all took the life of Christ, we all uh, died, we took the life of Christ and we all died when his life was taken. And if we rise, it's because he's risen in us. Jesus died once at the edge of time and eternity, but he died for all throughout space and time. So if, 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 if death is the penalty for sin, there's no longer a penalty for sin. Unless, unless some are terrified of life and so hide in death, for eternal life is the burning judgment of God. So you see, I don't think anybody, I don't think anybody is in the outer darkness weeping and gnashing their teeth because they've been judged. They're there because they're terrified of the judgment. Verse 10, the death he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to in or by God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to in or by the sin and alive to in or by God in Christ Jesus. Let not the sin therefore reign in your mortal, your thnetos, your death-like body, to make you obey its passions. Do not present your members, your body parts, to the sin. It's like the sin is being personalized here almost. The sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but present yourselves as if well, as if you were a body part, present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments of righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you, control over you, since you are not under the law, trying to justify yourself, but under grace, the knowledge that you've been justified. What then? Are we to sin because we're not under the law, but under the grace? By no means, no way. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey either of sin which leads to death or of obedience which leads to righteousness so 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 why not sin well because it means that you are trying to justify yourself which means that you do not believe that you are justified which means that you're not saved Instead, you're trying to hide from the life. It means you're a slave of the sin, which is like literally inhabited by the devil. It means you're trapped by hell and terrified of heaven. It means you crucified Jesus because you refuse to see that he's already been crucified by you and for you. There's these scary passages in Hebrews about um, uh, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sin. Well, there always remains a sacrifice for sin. He's eternal, but what is happening? We must shut our eyes, and we ourselves don't have the power to open them. So anyway, by all means, don't sin. And yet, be grateful that you did sin. <laughs> I mean, just look at what Paul writes next. This is so crazy. Verse 17. But thanks, or grace be to God, that you, and now who? I need to say who is added by a nervous translator. It's just not in the text. So it reads like this. But thanks be to God that you were once slaves of the sin. In other words, thank God for the tupas. 
Thanks be to God that you were once slaves of the sin, but you have become obedient from the heart to the literally tupos, the imprint of teaching or, or doctrine. The tupos is what I should do, but don't do. From the heart flows what I want to do. So thanks be to God that you were once slaves of the sin, but you have become obedient ek, out of or from the heart to the tupos of doctrine to or ice literally into which you were parodidomai, handed over, betrayed, or delivered up. Well, how were you? When were you? Where were you delivered up? Well, maybe you were delivered up with Jesus. Because think about this. Your life, since there's only one life and he's the life, your life is literally his life bled into the empty space that was once your old man, the Tupas. And because of that, your new man is not the absence of what you should do. Your new man is the presence of what God does do. It is the grace which fills that old temple that is you. It flows from the throne in the middle of this sanctuary, the Holy of Holies, um, in the sanctuary of your soul. God consigned all to disobedience, writes Paul, at the turning point of Romans. Why? That he may have mercy on all, to all, in all. So thanks be to God for your old man, because it's how he creates your new man. Anyway, next verse, verse 18. And having been set free from the sin, you have become slaves of the righteousness. I'm speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations, literally the weakness of your flesh. I mean, we talked about that last time. For just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness, leading to sanctification. You know, slaves don't have a choice. And you're either a slave of sin or a slave of righteousness. But Jesus is our righteousness. He is our husband. He's our life, the life that flows in your veins. So when his choice becomes your choice, it's not bondage, it's freedom. Verse 20, for when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regards to righteousness. But what fruit, what fruit were you getting at that time from the things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now that you have been set free from the sin and have become slaves of God, the fruit you get leads to sanctification and its end, eternal life. For the wages, the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So death is a wage. It's what I can do. <laughs> Create an old me. <laughs> That guy on the left. Eternal life is a gift. It's what God does do, and it's who I truly am, what I truly am, the guy on the right. But what do I do with the hot mess in the middle? What do I do with this? <laughs> That's the question. This is a hot mess. You know what most people want me to do with uh, this? They want me to help them judge this so that they can adjust this, hopefully hide some of this, advertise some of this, and maybe change some of this in order to change the judgment of, of God. But I can't judge this. <laughs> and you can't judge this. We can't separate the wheat from the tares in your heart. How would I know at what point your thoughts are love and at what point they become lust? But we do know that you have lust and we know that love has you. How would I know when the wine is worship? and when it's idolatry. 
And how would you? I mean, seriously, is it one glass? Is it two glasses? Is it 10.6 ounces or 10.7? At what point does all of a sudden it switch from hell to heaven? And just by thinking that we could know, we make ourselves the judge, and so we become the idol such that we glory in our ego, which is our shame, and hide our stinking mangers where the Christ child is waiting to be born. Because where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. So I can't judge this. And you cannot judge this. But hopefully I can help you get judged. I can help you do this. I can help you do this at, at the turning point of at the turning point of um, Romans, Romans chapter 12, right after chapter 11, Paul writes, Therefore, therefore, by the mercies of God, present your body. I think that's your, I think that's your, your psychic body. And, uh, that's your physical body. That's your me. He writes, present your, your bodies as a living sacrifice, which is your, holy and, it's holy and acceptable to God, which is your logical worship. I hope this is why you come to church. <laughs> to worship. To surrender your judgments to the judgment of God. The greatest relief for the neurotic sack of anxiety that I think is me, the hot mess that is me, is to come back to the tree and surrender me. And I picture this in my mind. I even watch myself die with him, and I feel him rising in me. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness rising in me. It's to come back to the tree and surrender the knowledge I take and receive the life he gives, which is the living knowledge that I actually need. In all my encounters with him, like the one that I shared last week, because I've had a few of those, they're just kind of blow, blow my mind, I've always been amazed by this about Jesus. He just does not seem interested in telling me how many beers I should drink or which movies I can watch and which I can't watch, and he won't tell me who to vote for. As if he doesn't want me to trust the knowledge I take, but trust the life that he constantly gives, as if his living love, his presence, is all the knowledge I need. You know, the old man is what you have done. And if you think that you will be justified by what you have done, well, then it's all evil. And I'm not saying that's what you thought about everything because something else was also in those pieces of paper. Every list on the tree reflects a confusing jumble of old me and new me, and we can't judge me. But the burning mercy of God destroys the old me, and it liberates the new me just with his presence what Paul calls the manifestation of his parousia, the appearance of his coming. At the cross, the old man is destroyed, and the new man is set free, and that new man is me, the, the true me. The new man is what God is doing, which is always now and so always new and cannot be destroyed because he is eternal. Well, I can't judge, and you can't judge, and yet I can help you get judged by preaching the judgment of God, who is the Word of God, who is Jesus. You see, he goes out like a seed. He draws each of us back to the tree. He cuts us like a knife, and he sets us free. Once Susan heard the Lord say this when I was really struggling with the sermon. She heard the Lord say, tell Peter that my word is a clean cut. God's word is Jesus, which means God is salvation. 
You cannot believe God is salvation and me is salvation in the same spot at the same moment. So just by preaching God is salvation, what do we do? We deliver me as salvation to judgment. Just by focusing on the man on the tree, we reveal the old me and the new me and reveal there's one tree and two me's. And by coming to the tree, by coming to the tree, we deliver both me's to the tree. <laughs> and God sets me free. And this is what I think is so cool. I don't have to judge me. <laughs> I just have to bring me to the tree. I just need to know that there's one tree and two me's and that my old me gets filled with the new me. The new me is the me that God has created and cannot be desecrated. So listen closely. The, the new me has been justified and so needs no justification. And the old me cannot be justified because he's already been condemned. The old me is the me that I think I have created but does not actually exist. So old me and new me, but there is no me that needs to be justified. So I may not know quite yet exactly who I am, but there's no me that I need to defend, right? There's no me that I need to hide. There is no me that I need to worry about because one is dead and cannot live and one lives and will never die. And if I do worry about me, it means that I've walked away from the tree and I can just bring me back to the tree where once again I can see that I'm free. Free to be me. That's the Superman we're talking about. That boy is not uh, trying to be who he feels responsible to be. That boy isn't trying to be Superman. He's just being super because someone told him, you're super. I don't have to judge me. I just have to know that there's one tree and two me's. And I don't have to judge you. I just need to know that there are two of you and there's one judgment. And the judgment is love. Every person has an old man only because he's the imprint of the new man. I don't have to hate the old man, judge the old man, or do battle with the old man, which only grows the old man and makes him stronger. I don't have to condemn the old man. I just need to know that he has been condemned and so he's already dead. Actually, I can thank God for the old man because the old man is how God reveals the beauty of the new man. The treasure, the treasure in every earthen vessel. Actually, grace for the old man is how God creates the new and I can help him create the new by speaking his word into the heart of every old man that I meet. Carl Jung said this to a, a group of Swiss clergy in, in a lecture several years ago. He said the truly religious person has this attitude. He knows that God has brought all sorts of strange and inconceivable things to pass and seeks in the most curious ways to enter a man's heart. He therefore senses in everything the unseen presence of the divine will. If the doctor or pastor wants to be guide to, to, an, to another, or even accompany another a step of the way, he must feel with that person's psyche. He never feels it when he passes judgment. We cannot change anything unless we accept it. 
Condemnation does not liberate, it oppresses. I am the oppressor of the person I condemn, not his friend and fellow sufferer. I do not in the least mean to say that we must never pass judgment when we desire to help and improve, but if the doctor wishes to help a human being, he must be able to accept him as he is, and he can do this in reality only when he has already seen and accepted himself as he is. I think that means that if I've accepted my old man, I can have compassion on my fellow man. If you've been to the tree, well then you can take others to the tree. And isn't that what Jesus does with you? Isn't that what Jesus does with me? He accepts me as I am, and so changes me into who it is that I am is. Jesus didn't sin, and yet he became sin that we might become the righteousness of God, writes Paul. The first Adam became a living soul, writes Paul. The eschatos Adam, the superman, became a life-giving spirit. Jesus delivered up his spirit, and then in the spirit he descended into every man. To the Pharisees he said, you judge according to the flesh, I judge no one. Yet if I judge, my judgment is true. He is the judgment of God. We took his life from the tree, and yet he brings us all back to the tree to be judged with us. Why? In order that he might live through us, and we might live with him. He said, as the Father sent me, so send I you. So you cannot judge your neighbor, but when you accept your neighbor and love your neighbor as your neighbor is, you bring him to the tree, and you reveal, I am, which destroys the old man and liberates the new man because you are the judgment of God. You're the body of Christ. That means you're his ambassador. And what qualifies you is nothing that you have done, but that you have seen that all you have done is dead, and all that he has done is coming to life in you. The love of Christ controls us, writes Paul in 2 Corinthians, because, 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 because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died, and he died for all, that the living might no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and was raised for them. And then he writes, therefore we are ambassadors for Christ. You know, Paul must have had the very worst of all resumes, right? I mean, seriously. He wrote on his resume, chief of sinners, put it in the Bible. That's pretty bad. Persecuted the church, why? To justify himself according to works of the law. It wasn't his decision to get saved. He didn't arrange that on the road to Damascus. And he made it clear that apart from Christ, he could do nothing, and yet Christ chose him to be his greatest ambassador. He could do nothing, yet you are here literally because of what Christ has done in Paul. You can do nothing until you see that you are something that is done. And how do I do that, you ask? You don't. It's done by a word, a word that I heard, and a word that you're hearing right now. It brings you back to the tree. It cuts you in two. It destroys the old and liberates the new. And he creates you in the image and likeness of God. And so he took bread and broke it, saying, this is my body given to you. And he took the cup saying this is, oh, there you go, this is the covenant in my blood. The life is in the blood. Poured out for the forgiveness of sins, drink of it, all of you, and do it in remembrance of me. So, what can you do? By the mercies of God, you can see that you are what God has done. 
and then you will do all things in freedom and gratitude and joy. Amen. So if you're like me, um, you're neurotic. You're a hot mess. And you just kind of get a look at the tree every now and then, kind of glance over your shoulder. And then you look at yourself and you think, there's two of me. You start making a list. And that makes you even more neurotic. I mean, was three beers bad or was that good? Is two beers good or is that bad? And Paul says this. He says, therefore, um, present your body, your bodies, your psychic body, your psychicos body, your physical bodies. Present yourself a, a living sacrifice. And so I don't think he means once a week at church. I think he, he means like all the time, every moment, maybe every morning, every evening. When you get that neurotic feeling because you're looking at the tree and you see two of you, and what is God saying? Well, just, Peter, just come to the tree. Bring your me's uh, to the tree. Because you see, we're going to do this together. We're going to die together. And we're going to rise together. Because you are me. And now, Peter, I want you to forget that other me. Put on the red capes, the blue leotards, and run around the yard. Yeah, it looks terrifying but it's the doorway to unspeakable joy and who it is that you truly are. So in Jesus' name, um, believe the gospel. And what should you do? Well, by the mercies of God, present yourself a living sacrifice. Just whenever you get, now I'm starting to preach again, but, I, but people always say, well, what exactly does this mean? This is exactly what it means. Stop! Shabbat. Stop running, old man. Because <laughs> that's what I do. I think I need to try harder. I need to try harder. Try, 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 run, run harder. And he says, stop, because you're running in the wrong direction. Just stop. Let me judge you. And then you can start running. And when you get nervous, stop again. <laughs> Remember that you're judged, and then you can start running. And stop again, and, and, and then run again. Stop and work, stop and work, and, until you find yourself home. In Jesus' name, believe the gospel. Amen.